Hello, everyone, and welcome to Bloomscast. My name is Seth, aka Phantasma Plumes, and I'm coming to you pre recorded from the game room. As always, I thank you for tuning in today. If you're a new viewer, hello, welcome. You have probably chosen one of the more interesting times to join the podcast. This is going to be more of a serious episode. And returning viewers, thank you for coming back. I'm glad that you guys have once again chosen me to be your source of entertainment for the next unknown amount of time, because let's be fair, the past couple of podcasts I have exceeded my talking durations for previous episodes, so you know, I don't, I want to kind of limit it back, because, you know, I would like making longer content, but at the same time, I don't really want to drag stuff out. Like I'm doing with this intro, yeah! <laughs> but... I want to say also thank you all to everyone who voted on Twitter today. So to give some backstory, um, earlier today on the day of recording Tuesday, I posted a tweet with a couple of different uh, options for topics for today's podcast. And you guys picked out how to deal with burnout, which honestly, this is the best week to talk about it because as the time you guys or at the time you guys get to listen to this on the following Sunday, uh, I would have already taken off a week from streaming because, just to be completely transparent with y'all, your boy is kind of dealing with a little bit of burnout himself. Now, this is by no means, you know, fully medical advice. Like, by all means, for more serious cases, while you can take mine as full-on intro and a more whimsical, humorous way to look at the various signs of, you know, figuring out when you're starting to burn out, and what you can do to recover from them, by all means, please, there are resources much better than I out there about dealing with burnout. Talking to a therapist, for one. Um, confiding in trusted friends is another. But all that said, I am here to try and give y'all my 27-year-old perspective into the world of burnout. And this is also speaking from somebody that has... Worked multiple jobs at once while going to school, and is close to being a C-level administrator while also, you know, trying <laughs> trying to figure out housing. <laughs> so I got a couple of, you know, modern perspectives on the young mind and all this. <laughs> but hey, to really begin with all this, look, all right. I want you all to know that while this is coming from, you know, a male perspective, this, like, following bit of advice is universal. There are going to be a couple of times where I call out on my guys because, let's be fair, we're prideful as fuck. We don't like talking about our feelings. We don't like, you know, devolve or devol divulging? Devolving? Divulging? I, w words. Big words. Wordle has not helped me with words. <laughs> But we don't like talking about when we're not feeling 100%, unless you are, like, close, close with buddies. So, and to be fair, I'm one of those guys, too, to some degree. Um, but hey, I'm going to call out on you guys, because I'm one of y'all, to some degree. And I want y'all to know, first and foremost, guys, we're human. It's okay to feel what we're feeling if you are feeling any of these following symptoms or if anything feels like this describes you, don't panic. Don't stress out. It's a great thing that you're able to realize it early on because you have now given yourself the opportunity to heal much faster because you're not as badly hurt. Now, granted, when I talk about burnout... I talk about burnout and one of the main factors of it, stress, is two different things. Because stress, to me, is the negative, you know, you find yourself unable to, like, you have so many things impacting you at once that you yourself can't function. While burnout is you are giving yourself way too much and you find out that eventually you have nothing left for yourself. And you start to suffer because of that. So if stress is inter coming internal to you, burnout is going external away from you. At least in my definition. Now mind you, I'm not a therapist. I'm not a psychologist. I'm just a dude on the internet that you guys decide to listen to. And you know, I really appreciate it. Tell your friends about Bloom's Guest. <laughs> Look. Alright. 
I can say from, and like, here's how this is all going to go. Like I said, I'm going to give you the steps to realizing that burnout's going on from my perspective. And then I'm going to give you some tips on how to heal. And I'm going to tell you about why I'm currently burnt out. And in doing so, I hope that revealing, you know, part of my struggles, you know, not only can you find something that you can relate back to, but you can realize that it can happen to anybody, anyone, at any time. And it's okay. It is 100% okay. We, like, let's... Topic aside for or topic aside for a second, we have been going through some heavy fucking shit here as you know a global community. There is a war going on between Russia and Ukraine that is constantly being fed down our throats. No matter where you go, if you are looking at the news, it's all about Russia and Ukraine. If you're on Twitter, all about Russia and Ukraine. People are retweeting it and raising awareness, and that's a great thing. But here's the problem to it, too, is if you don't allow yourself to disassociate from it and give yourself the proper break that you need, you yourself are going to start to spiral from it. And you find that you really can't do much good because now you're just doom scrolling and you're just taking in all this negative, negative, negative information because that's what's being put out to you. And you can find the positives out there and by all means... You need to be aware of what's going on. This could be the next big, you know, global crisis if it's not already. But this is definitely going to be one of the ones for the history books. Unfortunately for us millennials, this is another once-in-a-lifetime type event that we've lived through and we're up to like five now. Honestly, I know, like speaking for myself and probably for the rest of the millennials listening to this and Gen X and Gen Zs, I'm kind of tired of going through once-in-a-lifetime experiences. And I realize that is just another contributing factor to, you know, it's a stressor. But that said, you know, I hope that you guys, in, you know, listening and watching and paying attention to all these crazy things that are going on, like inflation's going through the fucking roof. Um, You know, it feels like everything's just going to shit. Because COVID is still around. People are still suffering from a different way. I hope that the very beginning of all this, you can stop and take a breath and say that you're okay. You may not be fully okay, but you're here. You're alive. You're here for a reason. And that in itself is the most important first step to dealing with stress and dealing with burnout. You are human. It is okay that you are feeling the way that you feel. And it most importantly, it makes you that much stronger because you are feeling the way that you feel. Because you are in touch with your emotions. And at the end of the day, people that aren't are the real people you gotta worry about. So, you're not a problem. You're not an interference. People that are listening to you want to be there for you. And people like me who are giving advice want to be an asset for you. By no means is it, well, I'm weighing somebody else down. I'm doing this because I love being able to help people. And I hope that at the end of this, I... If I haven't alleviated some of your stress, some of your burnout, you know, I hope that I at least made you smile to some degree with some of my, you know, great jokes and sense of humor. (laughs) But, because let's be fair, that extra smile that you just got, even if it was a cheesy smile, it's going to be a very important strength and tool to continuing onward like I know you're going to be able to do. And just like in the college episode, I will say it again. You are going to be just fine. We will figure this out. It's what we do. We can't re- and it's better than the alternative. So, that said, let's talk about burnout. All right? Burnout, in a lot of different regards, is defined as different things. People will say, you know, when you're super exhausted all the time, 
you know, you're burnt out. And burnout is kind of a buzzword right now because, you know, the great resignation, you know, people are leaving their jobs in droves because they realize that A, they can do better jobs from the comfort of their home, or B, they don't want to deal with the shit that they were dealing with or continue to deal with when other jobs are providing that much better. You know, and I completely understand it. I wouldn't, you know, want to go back to some bullshit job that didn't respect me after being free from, you know, COVID protection. But it's one of those things where you hear the words so much that the meaning kind of gets miscured. Where if you're just tired, somebody would be like, oh, you're burnt out. And then you start getting into this negative mindset of, well, maybe I am. Maybe, you know, a part of everything else that's going on, maybe I'm burnt out too. And that's not the case. You're perpetuating a problem that hasn't truly hit you yet. Not to make it any light or make light of your situation. But I want you to kind of sit back and just... You know, practice mindfulness for this, you know, duration of this podcast. And what I mean by that is I want you to, if at all possible, close your eyes. Not for the entirety of the podcast, but just for a moment. I want you to breathe, and I want you to try and detract yourself away. Remove yourself from whatever, you know, you feel is bogging you down. And I want you to be able to think critically for this. Because the worst thing about stress and burnout, and stress will probably be a whole different podcast because there's so many different ways to deal with stress. But the thing with burnout is, is you yourself has most likely put yourself in that position and now you need to figure out your way out of it because you've given yourself out too much. Now that is to say, it wasn't voluntarily 100%. Sometimes you're forced into roles that you yourself didn't plan on, but you still agreed to it anyway. You know, whether it was a nonverbal confirmation or not. Um, you know, and what I mean by that, and it, it kind of all meddles into what stress is, but for example, you might have said, hey, or like a coworker came up to you and was like, hey, I'm going to be sick, or I'm going to be sick, I'm going to be out next week, can you take on this responsibility? And you, being a good coworker, said, you know what, yeah, I can do that for you. And then all of a sudden, when your coworker comes back the next week, not only do they not take the job back from you, but your boss, who, you know, is looking over all this work that you've been doing, comes up to you and says, hey, uh, you did really good with that, uh, you know, report or whatever. I'm going to make you in charge of it. Dude. You know, it happens all the time in the business world. And because, you know, in our generation, more likely than not, you know, all of us are going to be going to either be like, yeah, no, I want to keep advancing. I'm going to keep doing everything that I need to do. And, you know, to keep going up in the world and preparing my career. Yay. For no extra pay. For more stress. Was that fair to you? I don't think so. So, really, I want you to just kind of turn off your work brain, the emotions that you're feeling right now, and I want you to think critically and think mindfully whether these things apply to you and where you sit on this chain. And then we can talk about healing. So, let's start from the beginning. Because I've already kind of pointed at, you know, a couple of them in my little example. But the first step to burnout is you set way too high goals, all right? Everybody tells, and like this is the worst time of year for it, because everybody has resolutions that they're shooting for, for the most part, for New Year's. Um, And sometimes they're just way too lofty. But you don't realize that when you set the goal. You know, it seems achievable, Or, hey, when you're in college, you tell yourself, you know, oh, well, I'm going to be going for this field and I want to be this position by this time in my life. 
you know, I met people while going to college that said they wanted to be, you know, CIOs and CISOs, chief information officers and chief information security officers, respectively, uh, by the time they reach 30. And they're going to find that perfect job, and they're going to go out, and they're going to work their way up. It's going to be great. Well, you know, while it's great to have lofty goals, if you don't have the proper steps in between, you know, reaching them, it can lead to your eventual burnout. Now, let me, you know, relate this back to me for a second. Me as a content creator, me doing the podcast, I told myself before I even started the podcast that I wanted to, well, like, even before I started really streaming again, um, I wanted to hit a certain number of followers, get to affiliate, uh, get to uh, partner, When I start podcasting, like, I'm going to set a high rule that you guys have to give me, like, 50 subs in order for podcasts to even be a thing. It was something I did back during September because I wanted to gauge interest in it. And I started busting my ass during September to provide content that, you know, people would want to watch. And so I could get more people on board with me. So that way I could be like, oh, you guys really want Bloom's Cast, wow! And it ultimately led to one of my burnouts. (laughs) You know, back after, I want to say like October, November or so, um, I took a week or two off just because I was exhausted again. Um, But that's the perfect example. You set yourself up with these really high goals That you do a myriad of different things. And this bleeds into step two. Which is, you know, you have this I can do everything mentality. When you have that goal and that's all you're focusing on. You will do anything and everything to get to that point. When you are, for example, getting started in your career. You know, when you're first out of school. Whether that's high school or college. And you're starting off on your job field. A lot of us accept, you know, bottom of the barrel jobs because you got to work your way up. And unfortunately, what we'll find is, and like, this also goes for anybody much older, you know, that's listening in on this. This is just coming from a 27-year-old, I think I know the world better than you do, clearly, I have a podcast. (laughs) No, seriously. If you disagree with this, I would love to have a discussion with you on stream or, you know, shoot me an email at plumescasts at gmail.com. I would love to have full on uh, conversations or hit me up on Twitter. Make it a public forum conversation. I'm fucking about that shit. Um, But anyway, whenever you start a new job or you're in a new field, you tend to have this mindset of, oh, I'm going to do everything I can. Because I want to, you know, go up to the next level. Um, You know, when I started, and here's an example. When I started working maintenance when I was working at Mercedes and doing, you know, building repairs and all that kind of shit, I would run around because I always felt like I needed to prove myself. If somebody put in a help ticket, I would be there in a heartbeat. Because I just wanted to prove myself to everybody that gave me a chance. And, you know, I wanted to move my way up. I didn't know where I wanted to move my way up. But I knew I wanted to prove myself within the company and learn different things. And if I showed people that I can work really hard, I, they'll teach me everything they know. And then I'll be able to take over for, like, service lane and service concierge And then I'll be able to be a manager. Like, I had this mindset that I was going to, you know, go from the bottom to the top. Now, did I do that? Yes. Did I? And, like, here's the thing, too, is when you, well, yes, to a degree. Um, When you are in these steps, there's no set line that says, okay, step one will usually last, you know, within... Zero to six months of you starting a job or zero to, you know, three weeks because everybody's different. Everybody experiences burnout in different ways and that in itself is okay as well. You might have still be in step or you might still be in step one where you have this lofty goal 
And that's a great thing to have. Goals are amazing things to have. But you need to remember, one, you are human. I'm going to repeat that a lot. If you are listening to this and you understand what I'm saying, you are probably human. (laughs) If you are a robot, that's chill as fuck. But hey... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Remember, I say thank you to all of my smart devices when the robot, uh, the robot uprising hits. Remember that. <laughs> but you are human. It's okay to feel what you feel. I'm going to stress that. And I'm going to stress that. And I'm going to repeat it over again and again and again. Because that's the key point to all of this. At the end of the day... You come home, you relax. You basically, like, we all, at the end of the day, despite whatever stresses and, you know, burnout that we're feeling, it's all relative to ourselves. So, in telling you this, if if a trusted friend comes up to you and says, I'm feeling burnt out, don't force your narrative onto them, okay? Like, if you're, say, for example, co-worker yours, exact same story started the same position you were in, and they came up to you and they're like, I'm starting to feel burnt out. Don't hit them with, well, we started at the same time and I'm feeling amazing. Oh, uh, you should continue to strive for greatness. Like, dude, fuck you. <laughs> By all means, continue to strive for greatness is a great thing to say, but at the same time, start it with, okay, tell me what you're feeling. Talk to me. What are you, you know, where do you feel like you're struggling? Give them somebody to lean on. And then, you know, if you feel like if they seem as though they need that extra motivational push, then hit them with the extra motivational push. If it's something you can't deal with, then hey, get involved with a manager. And I'm kind of giving you some healing advice right now. Still in step one and step two of identifying stress, burnout, all that fun stuff. But going back to, you know, that mindset that a lot of people experience is you can feel, you feel like you can do everything and anything, and then it quickly or eventually will lead into part three of this, you know, burnout slide where, you know, think of it almost like a playpen where step one, you're climbing up the ladder, you have these really high goals, step two, you're sitting on the top of the slide And you're like, yes, I can do everything. And then step three is when you push off from that slide. Because you start to feel overwhelmed. It's inevitable. Eventually, you're going to take on too much for your plate. You want to, you know, help so many different people that aren't really helping you. And you find yourself with the work that's, you know, compounded upon yourself. Like... And unfortunately, I can say I'm kind of at the two to three point at the office because while I feel like I can do everything, I realize the more I say, hey, can I help you with that? Or, hey, can you explain this to me so I can cover this? Or, hey, can you um, show me how you do this? The more likely I am to eventually end up being tacked with that, you know, role. And that is to say it's not a guarantee, but... You yourself are doing it maybe because you feel like that's the polite thing to do. Maybe you're trying to be nice because that's a friendly coworker, Or maybe you feel like it's your responsibility when really it could be outside what you need to do. Um, but eventually all that extra work that you've tacked on to yourself, the stuff that's outside your job description, overwhelms you. You start ending up feeling as though like... You have to do everything that comes through to you because you've already accepted anything else. And you end up, you know, starting at this point, you kind of start disliking your job to some degree or you dislike the environment you're in or whatever situation that you feel like. And it ultimately starts to slow you down. You start focusing on other things that are coming onto your desk, metaphorically, and you aren't focusing on the things that you need to, or the things that you need to focus on are suffering because of all the extra stuff that's getting piled onto you. You, like, there used to be this mindset of, you know, you want to be the yes man. You want to be able to, 
you know, take on anything somebody brings to you because it makes you look like a, you know, a model employee. It makes you, you know, better for raises and all that. When really, you know, you need to focus on your job description or whatever you are there to do. If it's school and extracurriculars are, you know, eating up all your time because they want so much from you, well, maybe it's time to ease off on some of the, you know, well-roundedness you're trying to keep. That said, you know, you yourself are responsible for you in the job sense. If your job description says you need to get A, B, and C done, your boss ain't going to give a shit how many times you did D, E, or F if A, B, and C aren't getting done. And that, you know, those kind of talks from management that are like, hey, your performance is starting to slack, you know, leads you into step four of all this. Now you're starting to go down the base of the slide. Uh, You're picking up speed. And you start to have confidence issues. You know, and this is also speaking from experience. You start to wonder whether or not you're doing a good job because the metrics that had previously been set for you to say, like, yes, you're doing great, you're, you know, achieving, you're overachieving, all that stuff have now fallen to the wayside because you have accepted other roles and jobs and responsibilities that those metrics no longer apply to you. I mean, yes, at core they do, but you yourself start to come up with metrics much higher. And when you can't accept things, like new things being put onto you, and people get pissy with you for whatever reason, like, you start to internalize that. Or maybe you do, maybe you don't. But you start to doubt yourself. Oh, excuse me. And what you do, and you start questioning your abilities, um, you know, and again, I'm going to come back through with all this talking about streaming and to some degree my work, just to kind of give you better examples of everything, but maybe you start reaching out to your coworkers and you're like, I don't think my boss likes me. I don't think so-and-so likes me. I think I did a bad job during this. When they see you for what you are, like your coworker sees the amazing work that you've been putting out, it's just you yourself start to become your own worst enemy. And that in itself starts to plague you. And then you end up bleeding into step five, which is kind of the curve of that slide you're about to launch yourself off, you know, where you basically, in lack of better terms, increase your copium. You know, you start coping. You find yourself like, if this was an HP bar, you are in the red now officially. You know, but you you're gritting your teeth. You you're like, I I can't give up. This isn't where I need to stop. And you pull out that hero mentality. You know, ever these people need me. I gotta be able to do this. I can't quit this job because I need to. You know, people rely on me too much, so on and so forth. And you really just, like, are hurting yourself that much more when really you should really start to rest. And honestly, I'm speaking to myself here to some degree. You know, this was me at the previous job by far. But you continue to try and take on more and more jobs and more and more responsibilities. Maybe even your core role has taken on more roles or more responsibilities and you still are trying to balance everything else that's outside of your department and you know your work performance is failing you find yourself without really much drive to do it because you you're starting to question all of it you're wondering what your worth is and at the end of the day when you come home you're exhausted because all you have in your mind is work 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 You know, fun times start to become more and more far between each other because you don't allow yourself to have the fun that you used to. You know, you're too busy focusing on work, 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 or school, 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 or anything like that. And then, eventually, you hit the ground, homie. Like, you straight up, you're at the end of the slide, you miss the edge, 
you skid across that fucking mulch or whatever hell they use. You know, some of y'all are lucky because y'all have that cushiony stuff. I'm talking about the good old days where you get off the bottom of the slide and there's fucking mulch and it just drags against you and cuts you all up. Oof. They weren't exactly good old days. I'm talking about, I'm talking like this, like I'm fucking, you know, in my 30s and back in the 80s and shit. No, man, this is like 2000s. We, <laughs> we didn't have the nice stuff. <laughs> But, you know, you got, like you end up scratching yourself up and you realize you're hurt. You finally see that you're bleeding. And instead of climbing up for that next big goal that you should be going for or continuing to chase after that goal that you set, you're down. You're out for the count. You're hurt. Maybe you're crying. Maybe, you know... You finally acknowledge the pain that you've been feeling all this time. And that's okay. You've hit essentially a rock bottom. And now you either are stuck there and you have no drive to persevere. You know, you have no clue where you want to go. You're ultimately stuck. You feel like you're stuck. You feel like you're trapped even. Um, And you're suffering because of it. And if you're in this stage, let me just say this. I've been in that stage too. And it gets better when you allow yourself to get up. Unfortunately, you know, with those cuts you picked up, it takes a bit of time to heal. And a bit of time to, you know, recalculate yourself. And sometimes, you know, you'll be stupid enough to climb up the slide a little bit. And be like, oh, well, I can can keep going. I'm, I'm, I'm a little cut up. But, you know, if I go down the slide this different way, it'll be better. No. All right. If you are at the point where you are 100% burnt out and you are lacking energy to do everything because of whatever burnout you are experiencing, it is time to start reevaluating what the hell you're doing and what you can do to get out of it. Like, I want to talk about, you know, ways to heal. But I want to give y'all one more, because we've been talking about this now for about 25, 30 minutes. Um, I want to give you the full-on example from me as previous job. So... I, as many of you, I got out of college, I was working retail, and I wanted to find my first IT job. First big boy IT job, I should say. I was already working IT, um, but I, and like, to be fair, I experienced burnout at a previous IT position, because I was overworked, I was stressed, I was exhausted. I didn't really think of it as burnout because it was all external stressors acting upon me. But in the same degree, when I look back at it, it was probably more of a burnout that caused me to get really sick and ultimately led me to leave the company. Um, And that's a whole story in itself. And I think I'll save that for when I talk about stress, if that's a topic you guys want me to talk about. Because the mindset and, you know, response... A stress is different from burnout. Stress, again, is, you know, coming at you. Burnout is you are giving yourself out way too much. And they can intermingle, you know? They can fully intermingle. But to give you the example from my previous job, you know, like I said, fresh out of college, wanted my first big boy IT job, jumped at the first opportunity I got, despite it being kind of, you know, suspect when I was you know, through the interview and all that, it didn't feel 100% like a place where I could, you know, grow, but I was constantly promised growth. Um, I was promised experiences, and I was promised all these different things. And true to the matter, I did learn a lot. But when I think back at my previous job, I think I learned more about how to manage myself as a person than I did myself professionally. So... I said I set a high goal. I wanted to, you know, I wanted this job. Like, I told the company I wanted to be there, you know, five years at least. I wanted to, you know, learn everything I could learn 
and work my way up from you know simple IT to being a systems manager and you know do the things that my superior was doing so that way we could work better together. Ooh, excuse me. But that's what I told them day one. And from like day one to year one and a half, I had that mindset of, you know, I had these like, I wanted to do this. I wanted to accept everything on that I could and learn as many different things as I could. And I wanted to be a part of different departments. And about halfway through that, like first, second I guess second year, I started getting involved with HR and I started writing training programs for all the different departments because no one else had taken the time to write it. And, you know, then I went even further and I wrote what is known as the Holy Bible for any IT position for any company. I wrote the CI, or I, yeah, no, the CISSP. Which is basically, or no, the ISSP is what I wrote. Um, And then I wrote the business continuity plan, BCP. But uh, the ISSP is the issue-specific security policy. What it is, is basically a massive document. I'm talking 50 pages plus, filled to the brim with text and different definitions and examples on... What to do when your company experiences certain issues. Now, some of y'all may have, you know, IT departments at the positions that you work at. I believe most of y'all probably do. Um, And you might have, you know, gotten a copy of the ISSP. And what it basically says is, like, for example, what's the password system like? You know, how does your company manage passwords? I wrote that for my company. And I dictated how each password was going to be from that time onward. And I implemented it, you know. Um, And then I wrote, like, what happens if, or how does email get used? What happens if email gets compromised? Uh, What about misappropriation, or misappropriate, disappropriate, misappropriate, misappropriate use of, you know, company equipment? I had somebody that was a social media activist, you know, that was constantly starting issues with different people online and it got back to the company. You know, how do you handle that? It's in the ISSP. If I had another instance where a user was mass downloading porn off the VPN and, you know, torrents and shit and, you know, again... What do you do in that situation? It's in the ISSP. This thing ended up being like 60 pages long, and I had that thing fully written out before I finished my second year there. Before my second year was over, I was starting to write some of the most technical paperwork that any, you know, CIO would write. And I was proud. I was immensely proud. They sent it over to the legal team, and the legal team reached back to me and asked if I had any legal experience, because I wrote that so fucking well. So, you know, and there's a bunch of other things in there that, like, device agreement policy, uh, email, like I said, email policy, usage policy, um, phone policies, like, we were providing iPhones, All that shit that we could do was in there. How to use the VPN properly. How to use encryption. You know, if you're going to get or bring your own device, what do you need to do? All that was written by me at that point, like 25 years old. Which, you know, somewhat fresh out of college. Because I wanted that experience. I wanted to develop and prove to the company that I was the greatest thing that they hired. I wrote step-by-step instructions on how to do various processes across the company to the point where I could not only do the scheduler's work, but I could also do the uh, customer service. I could also do warehouse. I could also do logistics. All those roles I memorized and I covered 
when the company had fallouts against, you know, my boss's greater wishes. And now, you know, as that continues on, the company's relying on me more and more and more instead of, you know, hiring people because now you're entering COVID times, there's mass firings, and, you know, they just think, oh, well, we'll just, you know, re- or redisperse the work. Well, you know, the people working there are already kind of tired. They're picking on more accounts. And then, you know, you have people that aren't fully trained that are failing on those accounts. And now you have more calls to your CSRs that are like, hey, this isn't being done properly. I need to talk to so-and-so. We have new managers coming in to try and fix everything. It was a giant clusterfuck. Short and sweet. And I was, you know, in the middle of it to some degree. Because I was handling all these different positions because they needed it. The company needed it done. I, you know, I'm not going to toot my own horn and be like, well, it's because of me the company succeeded. But you know what? I definitely had a helping, a major helping hand in keeping that company afloat. And one of the worst things I did in that, because now you see, you know, kind of at step three, was... I started to oversell myself. I started spreading myself way too thin. Um, You know, I kind of bleeding into step four, I ended up starting to doubt like my abilities. I want, and I felt bad that like some of the projects I was working on on the side were taking longer because I was doing all these different things for the different departments And, you know, unfortunately, my boss couldn't really protect me that much. He did it like he did a great job protecting me, um, you know, towards the end. But I had already made a decision to leave out of that company for other reasons. Um, But I was just like, I was, you know, basically alone in my, uh, you know, my part of the country because we were, you know, massive across the southeast. And I definitely was put on more projects than I should have been put on. I was definitely given more responsibility. Not to say I couldn't handle the responsibility, but the jobs and everything that I was doing and all the extra stuff I was doing that was keeping me at the office to like 6, 7, 8 o'clock at night, like even later than that, I think the latest I've ever stayed at that office, I actually pulled a you know full 24-hour night. And I was still there the next morning when people were coming in. And I was just like, but I straight out, like, pushed myself to the absolute limits because I wanted to be seen as this valuable asset to prove that I was worth the money that I was trying to get. And now you know why I left the company, (laughs) you know, to quickly gloss over it. I was promised to raise, you know what, seven, eight months before I left, and my buddies and I had a running joke. I was promised the raise at the end of uh, January. By the time I left, it was January 156th, something like that, because me and my buddies had a running joke that January wasn't over because I didn't get the raise. Clearly, January was just running really long that year. (laughs) So, you know, ultimately... I was pushing myself, and the thing that really just fucked me up the most was we were building out a whole new office extension, and the company was trying to do it as cheaply as they could. And I, who had run wires, you know, for other smaller jobs in that, you know, same company, was basically agreed to, oh, yeah, no, I can run wires for y'all. It's fine. I could do it. I ended up running... Over 50 wires across a brand new building, a new build out, eight offices long, and dropping them into the ceiling, cutting holes in all the lining so that way I can, uh, and all the metal beams and shit, so that way I can run the wires through because the company that came out and did it didn't give me feed lines all the way through. So I couldn't pull the wires down. Also, also, they didn't cap the top of those, you know, uh, crap, what are those metal beams called? Uh, 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 I'm gonna cheat, I'm gonna cheat. This is the first time on podcast 
that I'm absolutely going to cheat. Uh, what are the metal studs in the wall called? Common steel framing. Framing. That's it. I'm getting closer. The flange. That's it. The sides of the studs called flanges cut in the flange of the floor. No. Wait. Different types of metal studs. No. Fuck. Uh, metal framing. Metal framing. Here we go. Steel frame. Skeleton frame. Yeah. Fuck it. We're just going to say in the steel frame because I'm not not in construction anymore. <laughs> I'm in automation. <laughs> but anyway. So yeah, no. They didn't cut holes in the steel framing for me to drop those lines through. So now, not only am I inexperienced and unequipped to do what I was doing, I was doing it at a professional level to the point where I could still easily do it to this day. I learned so much shit so quickly about how to run wires. And, like, I can terminate wires super easily and terminate plugs. That's easy. I can run electricity. You know, that's not as easy. But... Running Ethernet was such a pain in the dick because no one helped. Like, I had absolutely no help. I was still being bombarded with, you know, IT tickets out the ass because everything was going to shit. And I just had, like, this, you know, ever-encroaching despair hitting me. And to the point where I was just like, I can't give up. Like, so many people rely on me. If I give up now, if I quit, the company will suffer because of my absence. And did it? Yes. You know, in retrospect, it absolutely did. Are, is the company still functioning? Yes. It absolutely is. Because let me give you one major piece of advice here, guys. You, no matter how much you do, are replaceable. You are a number. You are a cog in the machine. That unfortunately, despite all your uniqueness, you are replaceable. Unless you're the CEO you know, and have all the ideas locked in your head, you are maybe one of the few people that can get away with walking away and causing the company to fall beneath or behind you. You know, keep that in mind. Like, companies, they want you to feel as though you are part of the family. And by all means, there are absolutely some great companies out there that you are part of the family. Like, my company now, I feel like I'm part of the family. Like, I feel appreciated, I feel, you know, respected, I feel, you know, whenever we have gatherings, I feel welcomed, you know, and I feel as though, like, people can come into my office and talk to me about anything, because I have that rapport with people, you know, and I appreciate that to the highest degree. Now, that said, you know, Back at the previous job, hell, I was talking to two people from the previous job just today. Just texting them and see how they were doing. And, you know, it was like a day hadn't passed. Because we had that kind of friendship with each other. And some, and like, mind you, those were people out of my department. I haven't talked to my old boss, you know, in the months since I've left. Like, I talked to him a couple of times because it was his birthday. And, you know, every now and again we'll shoot each other a message Saying like, oh, hey, watch out for this thing. But other than that, you know, it's been radio silence, which is fair because, you know, I'm in IT. My boss wasn't that talkative to begin with. He was kind of reserved. And the fact that he came out as much as he did with me, I really appreciated it because he was kind of like an older brother uh, when it came to those times. And I'd ask him for like, you know, advice. And you're going to have people like that that are going to be sad that you're gone but the company itself will continue on. And you yourself can continue those friendships if you so choose. By all means, when you leave a company, the friendships don't end unless you want them to end. Unless they were fake friends, and you know, fuck them. <laughs> there, there's a bloom, swirls of wisdom for you. Fuck them. <laughs> that said, you know, ultimately, I was exhausted. I was, you know... I wouldn't say I was depressive, but I was definitely, you know, in a lot of pain. I was hurting. I was bleeding, like, literally. Um, You know, not talking just metaphorically from the example of falling on the wood chips. Like, I would leave out of there so late. And it's it's absolutely crazy to me now that 
at this new job where I drive out an hour one way to get to and an hour back, I still get home much sooner than what I would have at the old job. It's just the short and sweet. Not because, you know, I had a bunch of work waiting for me, you know, to take care of. No, it was because I kept myself there because I wanted to, you know, make sure everything was done. I didn't want people to doubt me or anything like that. I was in that deep copium inhaling phase where I didn't want to give up. And, you know, ultimately, I don't regret it. Because... From those experiences, I learned a fuck ton a lot about what I'm good at, what I'm proficient at, and, you know, my abilities, and then where my drawbacks are. And one of my drawbacks is I'm definitely a workaholic. My, you know, step one, step two, you set really high goals, and the I can do everything phase is extremely long compared to some people. Some of y'all won't even last like two weeks before you start getting to the... All right, I'm starting to feel a little overwhelmed phase. And that's completely cool, too. Everybody's different. You know, I said it before. I'll say it again. Everybody's different. Just respect that. But, you know, me being the workaholic, I can stay in those, like, painful phases as they are for much longer. And it's because of those experiences that now I'm much more aware and I'm much more mindful about my experiences And when I need to start saying, okay, I need to take a break. And that's why, like, these next couple of steps are all about healing. And why I feel as though I can talk to you all about this. Because this wasn't the first time I went through burnout. You know, I went through burnout while I was in college, working three jobs at once. And, but, you know, I kept on step five because I was so close to graduating that I didn't want to give up. And I got through, and I did it, but at the cost of, you know, having a more robust college life. I worked a lot. I had to get, like, let me remind you from my college, you know, podcast, I had to schedule out times to hang out with friends. Like, I actually had to pull up my phone, go into calendars, and say, oh, yeah, no, I got, you know, two hours that day, and then I got to study and do all this other shit. That's no way to live. Like, if you had to do it to get through it, you know, by all means, grit your teeth. You can do it. I believe in you. But don't make that your lifestyle. Like, the second you can finish up with it, do it. That, another plume's pearl of wisdom. The second you can get yourself to something better, do it. You will feel so much better and you will question why you put yourself through as much as you did. Now, that said... If you are a survivor of this shit, by all means, give yourself, like, a round of applause. Like, pat yourself in the back, because this shit's hard, yo. Like, nobody prepares us for burnout. Nobody gives you, like, you know, the comforting, like, okay, these are the things that you need to go through. I'm trying to right now, but I'm also coming from the place that said, well, if you're, you know, tired of work and all that, you're just lazy, blah, 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 blah. Your generation has no work ethic. And it's just like, yo, fuck off. Like, let me give you one piece of advice before I go on to the healing. If you are receiving negative feedback like that, you know, smile, wave, you know, be like, all right, thanks. And then straight up in your mind, don't tell them in person. doesn't go well. Um, Just tell them the fuck off because that doesn't help you in the current mindset. Now, by all means, you are going to receive advice that you're not going to like. You know, some of the best medicine tastes the worst. But at the same time, if it's just that, you know, bullshit mentality of, well, you know, your generation's just way too... Like, if it's those overly, you know, vague, you you know, older generation bullshits that people hit you with. Like, yo, this bullshit about, you know, we eat too much avocado toast and that's why we can't afford houses. Man... Fuck off. Fuck right off with that. It's because the housing market's fucked. Nobody wants to admit it. You know, prices continue to go up. Inflation's through the fucking roof. What my dad paid for a house and to feed a five family, I am struggling to... Like, I'm not terribly struggling, but I am barely able to do a one-bedroom apartment with. 
You know, and that's just the reality we live in. And when you get those kinds of responses, keep it keep it to some back of your mind. You know, keep it to some back of your mind. Don't let it, you know, all the way destroy you. But realize that that is how some people are going to think. Accept it. It's part of being mindful. You know, be mindful of how some people will respond and don't take it personally. You are not the millennial. You are not the Gen X. You are not the Gen Z. You are so-and-so. Just like I'm Seth. I'm not millennial. I am Seth. This is my story. You are living through your story. It's going to be different. And it's okay to look at somebody, smile, and say, oh, well, thank you for the advice. And then, you know, as they walk away, yeah, fuck you, Karen. Straight out. Like, oh, yeah, no, how much did you pay for your house? Yeah? The one that you're not going to sell? Hmm. Because it's worth so much money now? Yeah, fucking crazy how that all works. (laughs) Oh, man. Now I I definitely got some rants out on that. (laughs) All right, so... Let's, let's you know, move away from the aggression. Let's talk about things you can do to heal. And straight out, like, first and foremost, again, I've said it multiple times during this stream. You're human. Accept that what you're feeling is normal. It's okay to feel what you're feeling. All right? You are experiencing these emotions because they are valid. And if you take nothing else from this, remember, you are valid. You are living your story. It may be different than everyone else's. But at the same time, you know, even though your story is different, be mindful of how other people in similar situations took your, you know, took what they needed to do and did it. Don't completely shut something out because somebody's in a different job field than you. You know, just because I'm stressed in IT doesn't mean that, you know, my accounting friend doesn't have valid advice. It's different. Different words, different jargon. But we're all still human at the end. And the stress that we experience and the burnout we experience is similar. So, that said, you know, I want you to be able to start, like, another great way to heal is to remove yourself from the situation and think critically. Like, emotions are running wild, guys. I just had a full-ass, like, 15-minute rant that included housing because I'm annoyed about housing. It's part of the reason why I'm on a burnout period. You know, a short one. But, it, you know, understand that, like, I'm emotionally invested in this. And when I get to these points, when I decided, like, hey, I'm going to take a week off from stream, that was me pulling myself from my emotions and everything else going on and thinking critically and saying, okay, this is what I need in this current moment. You know, you need to be able, because here's the thing, if you approach something with too much emotion, if you go up to a boss with tears in your eyes, yes, by some means, it will, you know, elicit a different response, but you don't want to go up to your boss pissed off. And be like, we need to talk, slam the door. This needs to happen or I'm out the door. No. You need to be able to be mature, be emotionally mature. And say, hey, boss, you know, I'm feeling X. I'm feeling Y. It's making me this. Okay? Don't go up to it with accusatory language. Being like, you aren't doing your job as my manager to protect me. No. You have to be able to pull yourself out of your emotions and think critically and think, hey, what are the proper things to say in this situation to, you know, alleviate part of it? Because sometimes all you need to do is just raise a flag to it a couple of times sometimes, you know, like when you can take a step back and just exhale 10 seconds and think what you need, you are more likely to figure it out. Because when you can think rationally, you're bound to choose a better answer. Now, granted, sometimes you're not able to think rationally when you're in the heat of the moment. And that's why you kind of go into, you know, this next part of healing, which is kind of my later parts. Talk to friends. Go do something you love. Like, the second you can get yourself away from that situation, 
leave it at that situation. Leave work at work. Leave the office at the office. If you're getting work emails, unless they're fucking emergencies, and you don't need to respond to them, don't respond to them. You can read them, sure. But you don't automatically have to, you know, drop everything you're doing and be like, oh, hang on, guys, I gotta answer a work email. Now, do I do that? Unfortunately, I do. Because I'm kind of in a role where it's 24-7 support. But... I'm not on call 100% of the time. It's just the nature of my kindness where I don't want somebody else to be delayed because of something that's going on with a computer. Now, granted, I've told people, you know, straight out, hey, you are, like, I'm at home or I'm out cooking dinner, I'm doing X, I'm doing Y, I can't talk. Like, I come up with an excuse if I'm not actively doing something. Because let's be fair... You staying at home and watching YouTube or whatever, that is a perfectly acceptable acceptable way to ease the cool or chill burnout out. If that's what you prefer to do and that puts you in a happy place, by all means, that's valid. Make sure, you know, obviously don't do anything illegal. Don't do anything dangerous. Don't hurt yourself if you can. Um, You know, don't intentionally hurt yourself is what I should say. Because, like, I like being adventurous. And I'll tell you what I do when I get to those points. But, you know, text back, shoot an email back and be like, hey, you know, I'm off doing X. We can talk about it tomorrow. Or can we talk about it tomorrow? Most people are willing to say yes, unless it's an emergency. But, you know, you pull yourself out of those situations. You've given yourself time to calm down. Try thinking critically. You know, now that you're calmed down and you're out of that situation, it might be easier for you to figure out, you know, what your next step should be. If you are stuck in that role you're in and there's no signs of growth, you know, and you've talked to managers about what you can do, what you can't do, so on and so forth, well, then maybe it's time to leave jobs. Like, I've touched upon this on the college podcast where I was said, where I basically said, like, it's okay to leave majors. You know, it changes some things, but you're not bound by it. Guys, you're not bound by your job either. Like, the little stepping stones that you're making through your career now may not be what you're doing, you know, maybe on a different path five years from now. You know, you might be in IT support now, but then you discover, hey, I'm kind of a people person. Maybe I'll go to HR. And then all of a sudden, you know... Your path out into the river of life that you were going on makes a sudden right turn. And that's okay. That's valid. You have that option. That's the beauty of being human. You were given the ability to change, to adapt, to evolve to whatever you need. Don't squander it. And that, and like, that's also a perfect example too, or perfect metaphor, because everything you did to that point until you made that right turn, is a valid experience. That got you that much further across the river of your career, of your life. You can't, unfortunately, you know, life doesn't have an undo button. You can't go back. But you retain that information that you gained from what you did, and everything becomes valid, you know, as you go forward. And maybe because you have that extra information, you can look behind you and see somebody that is, you know, about to converge on your path because they're going straight ahead. You know, let's give you the example. You spent five years in IT. You went to HR. Well, hey, maybe you just happened to meet an up-and-coming HR. And now with those extra five years of advice, you can help that, you know, young new HR rep to understand life a little bit better and you give them a couple extra jump or you give them like a couple of big ass rocks to jump towards because you help inspire them and you know I kind of hope that in this metaphor I'm kind of painting the picture that I want for y'all which is hey I've tossed my rocks out I've still for the most part gone a straight line as far as IT goes But I hope, you know, other people that are following in my footsteps in my career, um, you know, and people similar to me can look over at my path and say, you know what? Yeah, you know, Seth's got a point. 
and then toss their rock a little bit further and be a little more bold and experience a few more things. And then, hey, maybe you're going to find out that because my path goes that way and I've given you that, you know, advice from my experience, you might find that you're about to turn on a path too. Though this rock metaphor has gone way too long. <laughs> I think I think the main reason it's going on was because like I absolutely like th- not too too long ago I was talking to somebody while like reminiscing about how we used to skip rocks and that you know me- like that image is just kind of rested in my head and I'm just like I'm gonna make a rock metaphor yeah <laughs> so you know but anyway. Now that you've taken yourself out of that situation, you're thinking critically, figure out your options. Like, seriously, you're at that point in the river, all right? You can't go back. What do you do? You can talk to management. You can talk to coworkers. You can talk to trusted friends. You can figure, you can start, like, by all means, here's a great tip of advice that not a lot of people do because we get so emotional and we quit before we have a plan B. You can start making your plan B before you quit without making it known, You know, when I left my previous job, I only let two or three people know in my current and like that company that I was leaving. And the only reason those two to three people knew was because they were my references. (laughs) And I knew I could trust them because I had talked to them a number of times prior to getting to the point where I'm like, okay, it's time for me to find a new job. So... You know, I exhausted my options with the company I was at. I didn't see any forward growth. I cast out a bunch of feelers on LinkedIn, on Indeed, and I went and did interviews. And thankfully, because, you know, I was working from home sometimes, uh, I was able to schedule, you know, interviews and just be like, yeah, no, I'll be available during this time. If you want to talk during this time, we can talk during this time. And that's what I did. Like, I absolutely revolutionized how I was trying to find jobs because I was, you know, quiet about it. And I even, like, I didn't go around asking people, hey, do you have any recommendation or any, you know, or do you know of any openings? Because that would just cause problems. No, what I ended up doing was I just shot blindly. Like, I knew what position I could fill. Like, I was looking for IT administrator. I was looking for systems admin. I was looking for IT manager. I was looking for chief information officer. And then I was looking for stuff even further out because I was like, well, maybe it's time for me to swap gears now that I have the working world experience. I was looking in, you know, finance. I was looking in HR. I was looking in, you know, I, for a while I was looking in um, uh, managerial support. You know, being an assistant to a CEO, um, I looked into sales to some degree to see if it'd be something interesting for me. And I went through a couple of interviews for that. Uh, I even went even further and looked into, you know, English as a second language. And I went through a couple of interviews. I almost went to, you know, not teach Japan or teach in Japan, but I almost did, you know, um, I almost did foreign language teaching. I almost did substitute teaching. I had a couple of other government positions that I was going for. Like I shot everywhere. And here's the mindset too, is when you have a job and you are looking for a job, you still have a job. Your bills are still getting paid. It may still be rough and it may suck to spend like 30 minutes, you know, every weekend or every other day shooting out resumes to whatever pops up. But yo, It's something, and you don't have to worry about, you know, going on to the next thing because, or, you know, going through, like, how long the interview process takes because, yo, you're still covered. Like, let me tell you this. I went through so many different interviews that, you know, I didn't hear back from until months after I started working my current position. Like, I had one opportunity to be with, I want to say... It wasn't Fox News, but it was like the parent company of Fox. Or maybe it was parent cop- company of CNN, maybe Turner Broadcasting. I can't remember off the top. But I had a full, you know, double interview. 
I went for the first interview, they really liked me. Went for the second interview, they really liked me. They told me they had some projects coming up and they were going to be busy and they may not be able to get back to me. I was consistent. Like, here's a great tip. Send an email after you do an interview. Send an email after, like a week after. You know, even before, like for some of these jobs, I had no clue what the fuck I was doing. I shot an email to that contact. I'm like, hey, you know, I've read through this resume. You know, what kind of things, what kind of additional things are you looking for? You know, what would make me stand out as a better candidate for you what can I prove you know and I got like I started conversations before the interview even started um or I shot an email out saying hey you know my name's Seth um I've sent a application at this time for this position uh I just want to thank you for the opportunity if you look through it um you know greatly appreciate your time like, those little things are what makes you stand out, and that's why I had so many fucking interviews. It was a lot of fun to some degree, because I got to, you know, pull out, like, different personality types to some, because I, you know, I was expressive. I can fully admit that I am the black sheep when it comes to IT. I am way too talkative. That's why I have a fucking podcast. <laughs> that's why I stream. Um, because I like being interactive. I like teaching. I like being friendly. And, you know, IT is typically seen as a reserve closeted role, but hey, I'm shattering the norm. <laughs> and, you know, I can talk to anybody. But all that said, I shot out all those, you know, resumes and eventually I found a job that I liked, that felt right that called me through and you know I went and like I was saying I got I got accepted for like five other jobs well after I'd started you know my current job including that broadcasting job I could have been working with a TV broadcasting firm that's half the country wide and I was just like eh, nah I'm happy where I'm at like they, they're treating me really well also you're not paying me as much but I'm bump but I'm bump <laughs> look man money talks at the end of the day like i know what i'm worth i'm still learning and like even though you know even though we don't all really know what we're truly worth i know i have a pretty good feeling of what i'm worth and i feel appreciated and if i didn't feel appreciated i would be doing the same thing where i just shoot out resumes and see what happens that said you know now that you analyze your options You've confided in friends, you've done something you go love, or you've done something that you love to do to kind of relax out. There are two other main things that you can do, and seriously, this one is so fucking uh, critical that we really don't talk about enough as a society, but yo, you need to sleep. You absolutely need to sleep. Put the phone down, go get some rest. I'm talking to myself right now, by the way, just saying to y'all. But go get some fucking sleep. Like, obviously, finish, finish the podcast. You, you have enough time to finish the podcast. Go finish the podcast. But then go and fucking sleep. <laughs> like, the thing that we're finding out, especially as sleep studies continue to evolve, is that if you're not well rested, your body is just ready. Like, even though you feel decently well rested, like six hours, you may not be at the 100% state that you need to be at. Your body might just be more like a reactive stage where you want to respond to, you know, different stressors. And that's why you feel so awake. But you're not processing well at the same level that you could be if you went to bed earlier. And I know it's a fucking bitch to go to sleep. You know why? Because I have struggles, like, falling asleep. But at the same time, like, you can do it. I know the biggest thing is the fear of missing out and not being able to talk with your friends after a long day of work. And if you need that, by all means, take the time to do that, but limit it as much as you can. You don't want to constantly be running off of three hours of sleep. That's not good for you. That's not good for you in the long term or long term or the short short term. You know, I can't quote this. But I remember reading that sleepy drivers cause more accidents than, you know, drunk drivers. Because sleep drunk is a terrible thing. And I'm saying all this and I'm looking at the clock and I'm like, damn. 
damn, I'm probably going to go longer on this podcast than I usually do. And then I'm going to go to bed. Well, honestly, I'll still go to bed much earlier than I usually do. I usually, like, to be completely transparent with y'all, I usually go to bed at, like, fucking 2, 2.30 in the morning. And then I wake up at, like, 6.15, 6.30 to go to work. You know? Because here's the thing, too. And I probably shouldn't be telling y'all this, but hey, here's a little secret plumes pearl of advice. Look, if you can't get eight hours of sleep or six hours of sleep, if you get four hours of sleep exactly, you will wake up pretty well rested because the typical circadian rhythm, the re- like the level of which you sleep, like a full sleep cycle, is typically four hours for you know a regular person. Some longer, some worse. If you can like wake yourself up around the end of that rhythm before you fall back into deep sleep, you're going to wake up much easier. But that said, hey, if you're having a hard time getting up and you're hitting snooze, that ain't doing you too many favors either. Like, it sucks. It absolutely fucking blows. And I am god-awful at this. My darling Jules can tell you about this because she, like, stare. I know she stares at me when (laughs) the alarms are going off. And, you know... Uh, I keep saying, you know, Alexa, snooze. (laughs) Alexa, snooze for another 10 minutes. And then I'm doing the math problems on my phone. Like, seriously, I have a great app on my phone. It's called Alarmy. There's a free version of it you can use that you can set up math problems on. I do, like, basic three-digit math. It works. It's annoying as fuck, but it works. And my, you know, basic math has gotten so much better because of that. But, also, hi, honey. Hope you're doing well. <laughs> Honestly, you know, and she, like, Jules is part of tonight's question, so I'm going to bounce back to her. But she's been such a major help in, you know, helping me remember all this because I'm terrible in my own advice. Um, you know, even here recently when I was talking about taking a break from stream she reminded me of a couple of things I said during a previous podcast, and I'm just like, God, I hate that you're right, and by extension, I'm right, but damn it, damn it. Uh, I appreciate her so, so very much. Like, seriously, having a strong support network, if it's friends, if it's a partner, um, you know, family, it's so important. Therapists, like... I know I'm not sponsored by them, but BetterHelp, BetterHelp's apparently extremely good. I, you know, if I had any faith in therapists after the crap that I went through with them, and that's a whole other fucking story, um, you know, I would use it too. And there are plenty of promo codes out there. I know Distractable, uh, the Markiplier podcast, usually is sponsored by them. Go listen to their podcast for a little bit and get the promo code. I think it's promo code Distractable. But, you know, I I probably shouldn't be advertising for them. (laughs) But, you know, by all means, if it's a resource you need and I help you get to it, you know, I'm glad that they're getting the commission for doing the thing that got them the, you know, whatever amount off that they get. (laughs) Look, man, I'm just here to help people. That's my goal at the end of the day. But anyway, that said, the last thing you can really do is start to practice mindfulness, as I've kind of touched on. Meditate. Meditating is a great way to kind of rebalance yourself. If you feel like that's something that will help you, there's so many great resources out there. Um, you know, and I can give you an example for myself. Like, when I first started meditating, I was like basically everybody else where I couldn't see anything when I closed my eyes. I didn't have that mental clarity. And nowadays, like after months and years of just, you know, practicing meditation in my free time and, you know, when I'm trying to fall asleep and my brain's going way too actively, I can kind of close everything off. And, you know, as you meditate more you start to see what your perfect relaxation spot is. You know, it takes a little bit. At first, you don't see anything. But then, you know, you start noticing, like, the rocks on the ground or the sound of water or the sound of fire. You know, whatever is your happy place, you start to envision it in your mind as you start to find that clarity within yourself and you start to balance everything through. This is clearly not, you know, 
by any means the How to Meditate podcast. I could give you guidance on that maybe one day down the line. If that's a topic you want me to go over, I can. But for me, when I am fully relaxed and I'm meditating and I'm just, you know, calming myself down after a long day, like I will probably meditate tonight, I, in my mind, see the side of a river. All right, I'm sitting on the side of a river. It's, you know, got rocks underneath, like underneath my feet, underneath, you know, if I'm sitting, there's a bunch of sand, almost sounds like there's waves to some degree, like as the river, you know, pours out of the tribute and the water's coming back in from like passing boats way in the distance that I can't even see, Um, you know, that gentle almost ocean-like wave coming up and splashing against the shore um, is sat against a starry night black or backdrop with a crescent moon or a full moon, and behind me is just, you know, woods. That's what I see, and that's what I hear, and that's what I smell, and that's what I feel. And that, when I'm in those spots, I know I can relax I can breathe, and I can let whatever's on me off. It's a really great feeling, like, when you can get to that point, and you can find your happy place, and you can just, for a couple of moments a day, like, seriously, if you are stressed, if you are feeling, you know, burnout, start doing something extra at work that's completely unrelated to work. It helps so much. Wordle, Wordle has been a great, you know, five minute distraction for me first thing in the morning like after driving in for an hour plus and I'm sitting in the office and I'm sipping on my coffee after I read the you know IT news that I need to keep up on it's part of my job field and all that shit um I play Wordle I play today's Wordle and then you know sometimes I go a step further and I practice Japanese on Duolingo um or you know I'll boot up Grand Blue, Grand Blue Fantasy, and I'll play a quest. Or, you know, if I have a little bit more time, maybe I'll play World Flipper for a little bit. Or something, just something that's so out of the way, that's so inconsequential, that it gives me... Or, hell, watch a YouTube video. Go on Twitter, post on Discord, whatever. But something that's so inconsequential that I can do for like 5, 10, 15 minutes... Just to get my head back on track, I guarantee you, if you spend two hours working and then five minutes, ten minutes, fifteen minutes playing, and then do another two hours and break it up like that, you will get so much more done and you will feel more confident. And this goes for studying, too. Because instead of denying yourself that joy that you need, you embrace it in small doses, and then you find out, hey... I'm actually okay, or I can keep going, and you don't feel as tired, Um, you know, but that said, you also need to be mindful, like, be able to take out the emotion from the situation, and figure out the underlying cause as to why, you know, somebody's acting the way they're reacting, or acting the way they're acting, or reacting the way they are, like, I'm not saying play Phoenix right with them, and pull up the psych lock, and be like, you know, here's this evidence to break this lock, you know, no, don't, don't do that, (laughs) you know, don't make a bigger thing out of it as what it is, but if somebody comes up to you and their body language says they're angry and they're screaming at you, you know, it's not your fault, it's something that has happened, you know, before, that has probably set them off, especially if it had nothing to do with you, like, if they come up, like, perfect example, I had a user come up to me the other day, and he just straight up opens my office door because I leave it partly closed uh, so that way I can retain heat in the office. But he comes up, swings my door open, like stamps over to me and like shoves his laptop in my face. And I just kind of look at him. I'm like, hello, hi, how are you? And, you know, he goes on to tell me that he can't find emails that he really needs. And, you know, he spent all this time looking for it. And he he doesn't understand why the email suddenly disappeared. It's from like a year ago. And all he had to do was at the very bottom of the search, click on, there's more, like it says down at the bottom, 
Uh, there are more emails on Microsoft Exchange. Click here to access them. He clicks it. Boom. There it is. And he sits there and he's dumbfounded. Now, instead of, you know, being a complete asshole like I could have been and be like, oh, well, look at you, fucking idiot. No, I made a joke out of it. And I made sure he was laughing because that's how people learn best. Like, if you give somebody a more personable experience, people are going to remember it that much better. And by all means, that's a great thing because the more you teach, the more you learn. You know, the more you retain. And that's why I love doing podcasts like these. Because it, you know, helps me help more people down the line when I go to talk about more stuff like this. But, and that's also why whenever I answer the phone now at work, because I know if somebody is calling me, they aren't calling me to say, Hey Seth, how's it going? I hope you had a wonderful weekend. No, they have an issue. I understand that. But that's why every time I answer the phone, I either start it with, hey, man, how's it going? Or, uh, why, yes, I would love a cup of coffee. Yeah, bring one in if you're offering one. You know, some kind of nonsensical joke that makes them realize just for that second. Because people, sometimes people need a reminder. Sometimes people need that, like, you know, unconscious reminder that, yes, you are human. You are not just your role in the organization. You are a person with feelings and a life. You know, sometimes people just need that small little reminder to be like, oh, yeah, you know, oh, Seth, I would gladly bring you a cup of coffee, but, you know, blah, 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 blah. And things tend to go so much better. Like I said countless times throughout this podcast, remember that you are human, but remember that everyone else is human, too. You yourself may be facing some burnout, but someone else around you may be facing it as well. And be a source of strength for that person. If you can be, if you feel like you can offer a hand, like, by all means, I feel like I can, even though me personally, I've gone through burnout a number of times and I'm going through it right now. You know, I realize where my burnout levels are. And if I can help you guys analyze yourselves and figure out, hey, these are my levels of burnout, and this is where I'm at on that fucking terrible sliding analogy of yours, you know, maybe you can do the same and help somebody else out. Once you figure out yourself. You know, obviously this isn't easy, but experience helps everybody grow. That said, you know, I want to talk about, and this is probably a good time to, like, talk about my current burnout and to give, like, I've given you the example of how work was with me previously, but I want to talk about it as a content creator, you know, and how it's impacting my current work. Because let's be fair, guys, like, sometimes the burnout you, you face are from factors that you don't even realize, you know, Streaming, the stuff I do, and like podcasting, being a content creator, even though I love it, has probably attributed to my overall burnout quite a bit. And that's why I kind of, you know, pumped the brakes a little bit like I did. You know, I realize that I'm coming from seasonal effectiveness disorder. You know, the good old sad, where, you know, and this is the thing with some people, it's an interesting topic to look up, where if they can't like, experience the sunshine, they're in, like, cool, dark, gloomy areas, they become gloomier. I'm unfortunately one of those people that is affected by it, where I can't, if I can't look out the window, or, you know, have something similar to that, I'm tired, I'm depressive, like, I'm not, you know, depressed, but my, you know, effectiveness is not as high as I want it to be, and that leads into my burnout. Because I start doubting what I'm able to do. My confidence is faded. Because I am, you know, down in the dumps. I can't pull myself out of my emotions to be mindful of what is actually going on. Am I actually doing what I need to do? Am I exceeding? Am I not? I got a fucking, you know, pay raise in January because of how well I've been doing. And I still had questions like I have my you know six month review um and start a year review where I got the raise and I still asked what am I doing wrong even though my boss said 
I have absolutely no complaints with you. You have been doing an amazing job. You've been such a welcome member to the, you know, company. Everybody speaks fondly of you. Keep doing the great job. I had the gall to be like, so where am I fucking up? (laughs) So, that said, like, as much as I love being a content creator, and I do, by all means, I realize... That I set too high of a goal. I set my expectations way too high going into this year. Um, You know, and this goes out to all the smaller streamers, smaller content creators. But, like, I had the goal that, like, okay, I'm giving this one more year because I wasn't seeing the growth that I wanted to see. So... You know, I, 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 if I don't get this goal, I'm giving up on streaming. I'm giving up on content creation. That's it. That's, you know, finished. Instead of allowing myself to realize, like, hey, yo, you know, I'm having a lot of fun doing all this. Like, clearly I'm having fun doing it because here I am on my break week creating a podcast for y'all. And I enjoy being able to help the community like I have thanks to, you know, the charity streams that we've done. And I've been able to grow a small community and I've had a lot of fun with everybody about that. And I get to play games that I usually wouldn't play because y'all suggest them. And I wouldn't be able to talk about things on a podcast because I wouldn't have had you guys if I didn't take the initial plunge. That said, when... And, like, I'm super self-critical on a lot of things. I can fully admit that. But I wanted to, you know, hit these goals. And, I, you know, here we are in the third month. And I'm not anywhere closer to those goals I wanted to hit. And I start getting super self-critical. And I start doubting myself as a content creator. And I start losing that drive that I had. Because I realized, like, you know... Well, why am I doing this? Like, the whole thing that caused this, all right, was a number of different stressors and everything else acting upon it. Like, the fact that I had to pay taxes on my stream revenue, like, that was bizarre to me. Um, The fact that, like, the recipe I made, like, the Friday cooking stream did not go well. Like, to me, did not go well because the recipe was a complete wash. And whenever that happens, I get depressed, like, I I don't get sad, sad, like, actual depression, but I do, like, my energy just fails because it's just, like, I work so hard. Like, Julie and I work so hard making that, you know, recipe, and then for just to, like, fail out like that just annoyed the shit out of me. Um, And, you know, whenever I have, like, computer issues and it's out of my control, I get annoyed about that. And I start, you know, doubting my abilities as a streamer even more so, as a content creator even more so. Um, And then, like, I finally just kind of sat down. Like, on Sunday, I was working on an animation. Like, I wanted to make an animation using my Walfus character saying, you know, Hey, welcome! I'm, you know, Seth, a.k.a. Phantasma Blooms. I do podcasts. I do streams. You should come, like, hang out with me. Because I wanted to have something that was like an intro. And I, you know, I got the recording done. I got the basic video done. I started taking frame data from all the animation that I needed. And when it came time to like put it into GIMP and remove out the backgrounds, I started doubting it. Like I was like, why am I doing this? You know, nobody's going to watch this. It's going to be like everything else. It's going to fail. And then I just kind of like... in by that standard just decreased myself to the point where it was just like I spent most of the day like sitting at that same screen like I would give myself the excuse well oh you know it's five o'clock it's time to you know go get something to drink or you know it's seven o'clock it's time to get something to eat or hey I'm gonna go take a shower and I'll clear my mind and I can do this and I started dicking around and doing everything else because I was afraid of that failing And then I didn't get to do, like, the Plumes promos art or anything like that. And I realized, like... And then I got, like, even more depressive about how bad stream went on Friday. And I was just like, this this isn't me. You know, this isn't where I want to be. This isn't, you know, the mindset I want to have. 
And this, you know, also goes in part to, you know, tonight's question. But it was thanks to Jules that I realized I was heading down that path. And, you know, I... And it was rough. It absolutely was rough saying, all right, I'm taking a week off. And, you know, by the time that you guys hear this, I might decide, actually, I'm going to take two weeks off to kind of give myself that time to heal. Um, You know, and, like, when I get to this point, when I realize, like, I'm starting to doubt my abilities because I'm overextending way too much into what I'm trying to do to try and make it, like, this amazing thing, like, by all means, I'm going to continue striving for quality but I end up sitting there and I start doubt like when I'm doubting myself and I'm not doing anything, that's when I know, all right, I got to pump the brakes because it's going to start affecting my work. And I don't want that to be, you know, what you guys see. Like when I come on stream, like, yeah, I'm, I'm human. I can tell y'all straight out. Oh yeah. I'm tired about this. I'm, you know, worried about this. But being able to come out as a content creator and say, hey, I'm having a hard time making content, especially when you're trying to grow, it doesn't bode well. But, you know, it's in that realization that, hey, I'm putting way too much, like, emphasis in what I'm doing on stream. I need to be doing X, Y, and Z and, you know, not worrying about A, B, and C as much as I'm doing. So, you know, I need to be being, you know, myself on stream, I need to, you know, have fun doing podcasts, I need to, you know, dick around and enjoy making plumes promos, like, those are the three things that I should really work on, you know, if I have the time, I could do the animation, if I have the time, I can make more emotes, if I have the time, I can do more clips, like, it's focusing on, you know, the important things I need to do instead of overexerting myself like I have been to the point where it's just like, ah, you know, I'm I'm just going to stop. This is too much. I can't do it. And so that's why I ultimately, you know, decided to take that week off, Um, you know, and to heal from it, like I am taking, you know, time to rest. Like I know tonight I'm not going to be I actually might get to bed or about the same time I did last night. I got to bed like maybe twelve fifty or so, which is super early for me. Um, so, you know, maybe I'll be able to get to bed. It's about midnight now. Um, about 12.30, 12.45-ish. I got to figure out what I'm going to do for lunch. <laughs> might t- I might take some rice and uh, some mix-ins and just be like, yeah, I'm going to make myself a... Gonna make myself some delicious rice tomorrow. <laughs> uh, but anyway, like I have taken the time to just sleep. I know I was neglecting my sleep and I'm trying to heal my sleep patterns. Um, so that way my sweet girlfriend doesn't have to worry about me staying up way too late and then dragging me to bed when she's here because I'm, you know, up way too late. But. I also picked up a couple of books because the thing with me is when I get, and like, here's an example of something, what you can do. Um, the thing with me is when I get to the point where I'm stressed out about, you know, anything, I get the fuck gone. Like I straight out will go out to a mountain. I will go out to walking trails. I'll go out to the lake. Like I do anything I can to get in nature, right? Right. I mute my cell phone, I mute notifications on my watch, and I ultimately go and get the fuck lost for, you know, a couple of hours. And I just put my stress to my feet, and I march, and I run, and I, you know, get out whatever stress I can. And then if, you know, moving around isn't doing it, then I find a comfortable spot, and I just sit, and I relax. And I bring a book with me. Like, you know, one of the reasons, like, why I wanted to talk about manga is because, yo, I like reading manga more than I like watching anime because it's physical, and I can hold it in my hand, and I can look at the pictures, and it's not something computer-related, and it's not, you know, burning my eyes because I'm staring at a screen all the time. Like, it's giving me that rest that I need and that respite. And so, and like, hell, getting the fuck gone could be me setting up my hammock in the back porch 
and you know just hanging there for a couple hours while drinking a good cup of coffee like finding out what you need to do to heal is one of the best things you can do for yourself and i hope by all means you know after listening to this podcast you yourself start to figure out like hey well you know maybe i'll do this instead you know find the thing that makes you truly happy in this world that puts you back to zero and do it if you have friends that you can do it with by all means invite your friends because if you are that stressed out they are probably worried about you and being able to have fun with you even if it's hard the first couple of times is absolutely all they want for you you know i've found so much solace and being able to realize what my healing elements are and using them to their fullest ability. You know, they're not, and like, here's the thing too, is like, you can have unhealthy healing things. Like I have a unhealthy obsession with, you know, fucking QT uh, taquitos. They are my go-to food. If I am working on something and I don't want to put it down, but I want, you know, something quick and easy to eat. Like, I will go get four of those gas station taquitos, two chicken, uh, one cheese, and one beef. And straight out, we'll just enjoy those. Enjoy the ride over to get them. Because it's like maybe a 10-minute drive uh, to get to the nearest QT. But I put the windows down, I blare my music, and I take that, you know, couple of minutes respite, go grab my food, come back. And then I feel much better than, you know, having sat at the office and just continued eating or sitting at home at the home office trying to edit something and it's just not going the way I want it to. Like, just taking that little bit of time or to even go get ice cream. You know, food's a good comfort, y'all. That's why I love to cook and introduce y'all to new recipes because, you know, hey, maybe you guys will find something that will be your new comfort food. And hell, maybe the process of making it itself, like, cooking for me has become such a big distressor. Like, that's why I started doing it every week, because it gave me an opportunity to, you know, express the humanity that I felt like I wasn't really expressing. Now, mind you, you know, I realize also that because I am so serious about my content creation and trying to grow as a content creator... And experience as many things as I can and reach as many people as I can because I want to help as many people as I can to make as many people that I can smile. (gasps) (laughs) Um, You know, I, I put way too much stress on myself and that's why, you know, the next cooking stream... I hope when you guys, or I hope when we get back to it, you know, either next week or the week after when you guys hear this, um, that it's the best one yet because I'm not freaking out about how many people are watching or whatever else. I'm having fun making a recipe, hopefully with my, you know, loving girlfriends because it's fun. It's fun for me to cook for y'all and it's fun for me to cook with her. Because we get to bond, and I get to bond with all y'all, and that parasocial relationship continues to grow. And god fucking damn it, ah, the outro just started playing on the previous episode. I promised myself I wouldn't talk for as much, but hey, yo, your boy, your boy's kind of passionate about mental health and taking care of yourself, because it's something that I struggle with clearly all the same level as everyone else does. Um, but all that said... The things that I can do better next time, you know, is realizing when I'm starting to spiral into that, when I start comparing myself to other content creators unfairly, um, you know, and realizing, hey, these are where I need, like, I'm comparing myself to somebody that doesn't even know I exist. Like, why the fuck am I doing this? And instead, you know, when I start noticing those trends, I need to A, get the fuck away from the computer And B, start realizing, like, the things that I do well. And, like, you know, enjoying that the conversations that I can have with you guys rather than all the conversations that we haven't had. Um, You know, and that said, too, I'm trying to do my best to take a little bit better care of myself so that way, you know, the burnout doesn't hit as much as it does. Like, you know, as I'm recovering and I'm starting to get back to that you set really high goals stage... 
Like, mind you, I'm climbing up the ladder, but I'm trying to set more fair goals. In fact, uh, another thing that I've done to kind of help myself over this week of healing, as it were, is I have uh, picked up two books. I picked up one book that was Everybody Has a Podcast Except for You. It was like, um, it was written by a family of podcasters. Like, I forget what their names are because I've never heard of them prior to. Um, but their tips and advice because I want to be able to improve the podcast and, you know, advertise it out and actually have like a resource that instead of sitting at the computer and getting upset that I'm not, you know, reaching the audience that I want to reach. I can step back, turn everything off, and reevaluate it with new information. I also picked up a book on Kenzai, which is the Japanese practice of, you know, setting smaller, more lasting goals. Because I realize, you know, as part of my great Scorpio energy, I want to achieve much further than what I currently can. You know, and I want to hit goals... Like, for example, I'm studying fucking SQL and Cold Fusion while trying to learn how to do video editing and animation all at once. And I'm somehow balancing it, but I'm not confident in any of it. You know, it's taking those moments of, oh man, you know, I'm overloading myself and breaking it down into things that I need to focus on. Like, okay, if you guys want the animation, I can make the animation But I'm going to make it in my own time instead of trying to rush it out and, you know, have something. You know, I'd rather focus on the things that I need to focus on at work and be more well-rested because I'm not panicking about, you know, being a content creator and, you know, how effective I am portraying messages and all that kind of fun shit. Like, I'd rather focus on my work where I'm passionate about And, you know, keep my expectations to the ground. Like, keep my expectations, you know, leveled, but don't, you know, fully... Like, even though I'm reaching for the stars, I have a ladder that is climbing all the way up. And I have plenty of stops starting to form on the way up. Like, for example, you know, and honey, I'm sorry, I'm just going to put this out there. Um, Julia and I had walked at around Ikea the other day and seeing like all these different housing ideas and how to set up different rooms and the fact that I'm going to be moving soon, most likely than not, you know, having all these ideas, I found one of those plateaus that I want to stop and take a minute and catch, like catch the wind on. And that's eventually finding a new spot to, you know, be able to produce better content. You know, I want a bigger kitchen so that way I can easily show off everything more and I can hang more cameras and all that fun shit so that way it's more, you know, interactive. Um, You know, I want to upgrade the equipment that I have so that way I can get you guys, like, a more consistent uh, video and stream and I can turn down latency that much further and so on and so forth. But, you know, right now, I'm focusing on the next thing that I'm making to be the next best thing instead of trying to reach six months down the road. Like, I have that mindset in mind that, yeah, maybe one day I do want to be a big content creator. Like, maybe this is the podcast that takes off and, you know, propels my career as a podcaster. But at the same time, I'm not, that's not at the forefront of my mind right now. It's, I want to make a good show for everybody that's listening right now and everybody that listens to it later on. But anyway, that uh, brings me to my question of the night. Like, what are the biggest lessons that Jaleel and Julia have taught you, which has come from our dear Remu? Um, Jaleel, by all means, has taught me how to be myself. Like, Jaleel had pulled me out of a terrible situation, which I'm not really going to go into a whole bunch of detail right now, because one, this podcast is probably going to go for two hours, and two, (laughs) and two, you know, this is not the time or the place to really talk about it, Um, but he had pulled me out of a very terrible situation, 
and he gave me a loving home with a loving set of parents and a loving brother. Like, he is, without a doubt, my best friend and gave me the opportunity to express myself in a way that I had never been before. Like, I fully attribute the way that I am now to Jaleel giving me the chance to be myself because I, again, never had the opportunity to, you know, and I cherish his friendship and his brotherhood and his family more than words can ever describe. That said, Julia is very much the same. Julia has allowed me to experience, you know, emotions and feelings in a way that I have never really felt before and has given me one of the greatest partners I could ever ask for. Like, she has absolutely reminded me time and time again, both through her actions and her words, that I have her support and that I'm doing a lot better than I realize myself that I'm doing. And she's reminding me, you know, that I need to kind of come down and touch, you know, touch grass and breathe air and straight out, you know, realize, like, take a minute to stop and appreciate everything that I've done to this point and all the hard work that I've put in and realize that, you know, instead of the slacker that I felt like I was, I'm actually a really hard as fuck worker. And, you know, hopefully you guys that hear all of this are inspired by, like, she says that y'all are inspired by my words and that I, you know, leave a lasting impact on everybody that I meet, that I'm super friendly. And she has given me a set of eyes and a set of view, or like a whole viewpoint that I never really got to have about myself. And in that, you know, I return the favor I hope <laughs> you know um I never really felt as cherished as I had with her and I completely appreciate everything she's done for me because she reminds me that I'm human and she reminds me that it's okay to feel the emotions that I feel and experience the things I do Just the same as Jaleel has given me the ability to express myself in a way that I never would have had before. He taught me how to express myself, and Julia has taught me that it's okay to express myself. And it's because of the two of them that I can continue on and make the content that I do and be the person that I am and have, like, the mindset that I do because, again... They reminded me when I, you know, really needed it, that I'm human. That's okay to feel, and it's okay to feel the feelings that I feel. And I love them both dearly, both in different ways for obvious reasons, you know. But I couldn't ask for two better people in my life. And I am so ungodly blessed to have had them, you know, both Jaleel and Julia, for as long as I have, and I hope I can keep them in my life until, you know, the last breath. I cherish them above all else. And if it takes them hearing me say this, then hey! (laughs) You know, hi guys! (laughs) I love you! (laughs) But, all that said... You know, I had I had a lot of fun with this episode. It definitely um it definitely took a lot of turns and I definitely got a lot more emotions out than I was originally planning on, but at the same time, like I'm grateful you guys have given me the opportunity to talk about, you know, a more serious topic. I'm glad you guys chose it. Um I will be doing more polls in the future of just randomly selected topics on Twitter usually. I will probably set them up on Tuesdays just to be like, okay, here's the topics. You guys got six hours to vote on them. Um, usually I link, or I'll link them in the Discord and be like, okay, hey, voting's up. If you guys have questions you want to ask, ask them below, shoot me the email, so on and so forth. Um, but that said, if I need to expand that out, you know, from like Sunday night, from when I 
published an episode of Plume's Cast or Sunday afternoon when I published an episode of Plume's Cast and to, you know, whenever I go to record, you know, I can do that too. I want to try to make this as accessible as I can be so that way everybody has a chance to voice their opinion and talk to me and get the conversation going. Um, you know, I hope to be a resource for y'all going forward to remind you that you too are human and you are completely valid in everything that you've experienced. And I can fully see that so long as you never give up, you will get to the future you want to get to. That said, who my fucking God, it's almost been two hours since I started talking. Um, really, I just want to say, guys, seriously, thank you all so much for listening in. It's been a lot, like I said, it's been a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, who knows what the next episode will be. I'll put up a couple more topics. Uh, to get in contact with me, feel free to follow me at uh, on Twitter, at Phantasma Plumes. You can find me on twitch.tv slash Phantasma Plumes. And make sure to subscribe to the podcast, too, so that way you get a nice notification every Sunday at 2 o'clock when a new episode drops, like this one. Um, that said, guys, seriously... Thank you all so, so very much for listening in. And as always, I'll talk to you again from the stars very soon. Until next time, everyone. Bye.